And I was climbing up an ice fall. It was a uh, one of those really could happen, you know, so easy but avoidable, but also you can't do anything about it. He and I were climbing to the left hand side of a big ice fall, and there were two gliders top right. And it was no one's fault. It was just a freak accident. And he said, "Head." So I ducked down, the helmet, sunglasses on, great green jacket. I was looking good, and um, and it was going quiet. And then I sort of looked up to do to think, perfect's gone past to move my top one of my right ice axe. And just I looked up, the last freaky bit of ice came down. Whacked me. The sort of list of what you've done is absolutely incredible over the last, what, 10, 12, 12 years or so. And I suppose probably for people listening, the best place is to sort of start with you and how you sort of got into doing what you're doing with these adventures. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it was a mistake, actually. <laughs> um, I was meant to be a one-off. Um, in 2008 to do the, the Sahara, which is seven marathons in six days. It was meant to be a one-off with my sister to raise money for my memory of my father from Macmillan and um, made it, survived it. I mean, everyone's meant to, everyone, everyone in the race had a sort of rucksack, really sort of probably like four or five kg max. And we both had a kitchen sink on our back. We had everything. You know, we were ready to be there for a month if needs be. And um, so we had no idea what we were doing. Complete rookies. But um, she sadly didn't complete it because of her knee. But I did make the finishing line and completely loved it. And it sort of opened up a can of worms of my sort of competitiveness, stubbornness, my sort of adventure streak. And it's gone horribly wrong since. <laughs> so after the Marathon de Sable, was that sort of the kick? And was that sort of you sort of had the drug of adrenaline and you were like, right, how could I push myself further? Yeah, completely. And um, so I thought, well, maybe when you one more, you know, the classic always dangerous and maybe one more. So I um, signed up for the Atacama, which is similar format um, in spring of 2009, which went it went a bit wrong. I tore my meniscus on day four, and um, which I don't recommend to anyone. It's incredibly painful. And how many painkillers you're inhaling, it doesn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. I got to a checkpoint, strapped up my knee. I thought I was absolutely fine. And, water and painkillers and I sort of did another 5k and realized that I sort of had a balloon of a sort of knee and it wasn't it wasn't going to make any better so I had to wave the white flag so I'm not very good at not completing something so I thought right better go back to the Atacama in 2010 and while I was you know thinking about that planning that and now someone told me that no woman had done all four deserts in a year so obviously another red flag to a bull and that's how I came about doing all four in a year which I think my body didn't, I didn't think I fully appreciated what it would do to my body, sort of the training, the sort of time off work, just just the combination of everything. Um, and it was an amazing experience, wouldn't change it for the world, but definitely wouldn't probably recommend doing that many ultras in a year. <laughs> Good. And so uh, your time in the Atacama, I, I suppose... In terms of training for the sort of races, how did you go about it? Yeah, a lot of Bikram yoga because you know, being based in the based in the UK, it's not very easy to train for heat <laughs> the heat of a desert. Um, so it was, it was an outer chamber near in London and combination of that and Bikram yoga, which is not your sort of average Monday spin class. Um, but it you know it did, it did help, and I think once the Atacom was the first before that year, and weirdly once you're at a certain level of fitness of that it was cases of ticking over so I was never going to win these races it was more about survival <laughs> than not sort of coming on the podium but ironically that year and this is sort of March March time in 2010 was when there was a big um, earthquake in Santiago so we to get to San Pedro we had to go via Argentina and I met up with another sort of team of British guys and we had to do a road trip across the Andes from Salt to just Pedro to get us to the, fit to the start line. So, you know, it was meant to sort of meant to arrive these things very calm, prep and everything. And actually it was, it was the most extraordinary road trip, which was great fun, but not quite the sort of prep we were meant to for the pre, pre and ultra race. Oh, wow. And so you'd sort of done, done the, so when did you, so you completed all of them within the year? Is that Yes, it was March, June. September, October, sorry, and November. So it was sort of nine months, basically, of 2010. We spent, you know, the nine months of total of the, the four races. Um, but it was amazing. You know, you see different places and, you you know, it's 
it's the sort of the whole experience of it and the sort of local airports have you know china didn't particularly like us going there at the time and then remember that you know suddenly in a room to airport and they're like why are you here you've got to go home we're like no no <laughs> producing all the paperwork you know what it was like um you know the road trip to the atacama and heading back to sahara that was quite surreal sort of knowing I was about to see 360 sand dunes for another seven days, which is not great for the mental thing. And then, then the Atac- Atacama one, which was sailing through the Drake Passage. So it was completely a year of extremes. But I probably should have stopped then. And so you, but you continued on. I did continue on. I, um, I've always loved mountains, um, but never, you know, been slightly obsessed by Everest, but never thought I'd be able to climb it or be able to climb any sort of high altitude one because you know, some, some, some of us aren't meant to be up there. And I was doing a talk at the RGS for a chari- an army charity evening and I hopped on stage and I was the only female speaker then. I hopped on stage with a broken leg, which is not the best look, you know, when you're trying to be up there in a little black dress. And, um, and the guy speaking before me had cl- just come back from Everest. And so obviously, you know, one story led to another and I got talking to him after that evening and I was like, well, you know, if... If I wanted to climb Everest, how would I go about it? Because obviously I wasn't overly technical at that stage. And obviously, you know, you have all these armchair critics saying it's not technical in certain places. And, but I think you still need to know what you're doing. And, um, and so he put me on the track of, and that's when the seven, start, seven summits started. And so when you say he put you on track, how, how, does, how does one start to climb Everest in terms of the planning, the logistics that go through it? Yeah, I know exactly. Sorry, yeah, back on track. It's like, it makes it sound so easy. I um, he was there was a he recommended I spoke to this guy called Rob Castley, who and actually we met him um, and we sort of arranged to meet up. He's, he's based in Canada. He's a British high altitude climber, doctor guide, and um, he's based in Canada with his French wife. And we met up. Actually, I remember it was the London 2020 to 2022 uh, 2012. I have to edit that bit up. London 2012 Olympics. And we met um, in the park there. And just, you know, he was doing, he was doing an Aten Kagura exhibition that winter. And, you know, wanted to meet me, what I was like, see whether my character would work. So he had a trip going. I mean, you can't just throw people in. Because, you know, mountains aren't the kind of place to have sort of, you can't have egos up there. You can't have arrogance, luckily. And um, I got on like a house on fire. It was like sort of talking to an old friend. It was brilliant. Um, and we went, we decided that, you know, you know, he could help me with all the climbs and he was sort of, you know, he'd been on Everest. He was had an exhibition going in a couple of years' time. So there was a sort of stepping stone which we could work out. Um, so I went to Akankagi with him that winter. How, how was that? I mean, in terms of preparing your body for mountain climbing, had you ever done it before or? I, I'd, I'd done some, some small things, but I'd never sort of done anything ridiculous. And I, you know, I'm, I'd, I'd been in sort of tent for days on end, nights on end, but but never sort of, you know, it's slightly different when you're sort of too many layers, but now I was having to pack them down and not the, sort of, you know, the, the, the T-shirt and shorts. But I absolutely loved it. Didn't have a headache. You know, there's no altitude sickness. Not, none of the sort of signs you always have to look out for. We had, um, we were very lucky. We had, I think it helped that we had a good trip. There was no sort of, there weren't too many dramas. You know, we had okay-ish weather you know there was nothing sort of drastic so I think that sort of helped with my sort of first big you know um, four weeks in a tent it sort of you know it helped and I, and I absolutely loved it except for the summit morning when everyone could see you could see everyone was always talking about you could see the you know, Pacific you could see so far honestly I could have been the Brecon Beacons my summit photo of that is just basically like one big cloud <laughs> and my family even said are you sure you're there I'm like I promise you I'm on the top so apart from that photo it was an amazing experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I I'm not quite on the same level but there's a peak in Sri Lanka where you it's meant to be all sort of quite holy and you know Adam and Eve sort of made love there or some some and Muhammad put a his foot earprint in the a stone or something anyway there's it's all quite religious and everything and apparently you climb up at night for four or five hours and it's quite sort of as you say difficult um not on your scale but and uh, anyway when we got to the top <laughs> cloud freezing cold just like and then you had to walk all the way down you're like that was great <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah, I know. that's what's so funny. you have all these you hear all these stories and how amazing it is and then suddenly you're like oh and in terms of these sort of expeditions like that one what are the sort of amazing moments that you have that sort of keeps you motivated to go on to the next one 
I think it's it's the food you it's the what it's amazing what your body can do whether it's you know survive it can survive on so little you know you know we're hungry at work or you're having a bad you know Monday or Tuesday you've had a big weekend you're sort of you think you're starving at lunchtime don't you and you sort of you raid the fridge whereas actually what your body can do on small reserves is incredible and I think it's always I enjoy pushing myself to see how far obviously I don't starve myself in the mountain but it's quite amazing what you can do and also waking up above the clouds. And knowing you've got there, using your own legs, or when you're in a plane looking out, and like, hang on, I got to this level, you know, using my feet, and I like that. That I just love, and it's also your cut off from the from what the world, you know, the comms, the everyday sort of emails and the social media, and which is all very well, but it's also quite good to step back and zone out, so to speak. Yeah, no, I agree. And so you're sort of. Moved on to there, and so your attempt in Everest that was in 2014. Yes, so I went out with um, this great guy. We had good, te- we had a really good team. We'd all had a, tra- um, we'd all climbed together in Chamonix about a couple of months before. Just, just you know, mm-hmm. you you need to know what your teammates are like. You know, if I go quiet, people know to get. You know, I need a chocolate bar very quickly, and I don't go quiet very easy. So check, I'm okay. Whereas, you know, I know a guy who sort of starts talking lots. So that's not very him. You need to know each other's sort of quirks. So if something does go horribly wrong, you know. You know, that's whether they're you know, in a good state or bad. Um, and we were there in 2014. And sadly, we were heading into the ice fall that first morning of the rotation when the Serac came off and killed 18 Sherpa, which was utterly horrific. And the case of sliding doors could have been a couple of hours later. We might have been in, might have been in the ice fall as well. And we, were, we had our um, harnesses on. We were heading into the mess tent for a quick bit of porridge before heading into the ice fall. In the early hours, and we had a you know radio message saying hold hold tight, and you just think you never envisage how bad it is. You think oh perfect, extra couple of pieces of toast, and you keep eating on the mountain. We'll be we'll be you know heading off in a couple of hours, and then it's sort of developed into the disaster we know it is now. Um, and it was very surreal being at base camp while it was all unfolding, um, because I said Rob is a doctor, so he was red strength the ice because he knew it, so he was helping rescue people his wife was a cardiologist so she was when i say helipad don't think of bassy i'm thinking you know a pile of stones there when everyone's being rescued or bodies retrieved um and we all and you're also in a weird bubble when you're on a, you know, when you're on an expedition or on a mountain you are in a slight sort of bubble you you know people at home who adore you and love you but you, you, not, you don't forget they're there but you you have to sort of take some while to remember actually they might hear about this quite quickly and everest being everest the news Good or bad flies very quickly, doesn't it? And so we all had to make phone calls home on a sat phone saying, Look, go back to sleep, because we're obviously falling three quarter hours ahead over there. Just remember this phone call, go back to sleep. And thank goodness we did do that, because obviously it's Easter Monday, bank holiday, there was no other news in the UK, and it just went like well for us. All our families wake up to messages on their mobile saying, Are they okay? Are they okay? Okay. And luckily we managed to get a message saying, You're okay. So we then we then flew home. Because obviously all expeditions were off, and um, some expeditions wanted to continue, but the local Sherpa were being they were sort of they were being threatened because it was turning it turning political, and it's just not it's not it wasn't very good for anybody. So the whole mountain because we came home. So I thought, right, there's another new year, so let's go and try and 2015. And I was on a final <laughs> training climb in Chamonix um, with a guide friend over there, and I got caught in ice avalanche, which I'll send you a photo, and I've got a small scar here. It's disgusting. I'll send it when you just don't look at it when you've been eating. And, um, and I was climbing up an ice fall. It was, uh, one of those really could have, you know, so easy but avoidable, but also you can't do anything about it. He and I were climbing to the left hand side of a big ice fall and there were two gliders top right. And it was no one's fault. It was just a freak accident. And he said, head. So I ducked down, helmet, sunglasses on, great green jacket. I was looking good. And, um, and it was going quiet. And then I sort of looked up to do, to think perfect. It's gone past. To move my top one of my right ice axe and just I looked up the last freaky bit of ice came down whacked me and I just thought it was nothing you know you get hit in your head and you sort of your momentary days luckily crampons and ice the other ice axe were in the walls so I wasn't going anywhere and so I looked down my sunglasses had fallen off they were full of blood my bright green jacket is no longer green I was like hmm, I think I might have to go down <laughs> so I sailed down and luckily because I was surrounded by ice and snow I could get on you know I could cold compress it really quickly so it's helped the scar but I am um, Smashed my cheekbone, couldn't see out of my eye for three weeks, and that was when my 2015 Everest expedition was called off, which actually is a sign of moment again because then Nepal had the earthquake and my team was stuck at Camp One. So 
yeah, it was meant to be in a in a very weird way. God, that's sort of incredible. So you had you had done two thousand and four, which was sort of a disaster. Then, sorry, two thousand and fourteen. That's the one. So in two thousand and fourteen. Um, you had that sort of setback. And then was it 2016 when you made the second attempt? Uh, no, 2015 was when I smashed my face and was meant to try and go and then I had to cancel because of my my broken cheekbone and I, I couldn't see out of it for a while. Um, and I was carrying a sort of pirate motive. You know, I was, had a you know, patch on my eye for a while. I was sending a photo. Um, so then we decided to actually take a step back. It's, actually, it's, it's, so, it's such a big expedition to plan Emotionally, physically, mentally, everything. And actually, the whole was maybe maybe the mountains to tell me to have a have a break or two. Um, so then I went to Denali in 2017 in Alaska, um, which was stunning, the most incredible mountain. If you've never been, I highly recommend this the most beautiful mountain range. And you're sort of dropped, and it's very old school climbing. You're dropped in the middle of nowhere by this little plane at base camp, which just sounds very grand, but it is literally just a maybe two or three tents, there's nothing else there. And um, and you've got your rucksack and sled and there's no resupply. You, whatever you need for the three, four weeks of your ice is on your back or in your sled. So it's very definitely so out there. And and we loved it. And we got to high camp. We had great rotations up and down. And, and we got to high camp at Denali and we obviously then had a whiteout. Nothing ever goes according to plan, is it? So we descended. But luckily, the rest of my team wanted to descend after that. They'd had... You know, they'd have extra eggs at high camp. I thought that was that, that they were heading home. Um, but the guide coming up, I'd climbed before somewhere else. So I um, I jumped onto his team, made sure I had enough supplies, and they went back up. And we had the most beautiful, clear summit day four days later. You know, everything aligned, which was amazing. And after that, having another good experience in a big mountain, it's like, right, we can get, you know, felt ready to go back to Everest, the attempt to Nepal again. So was it third time lucky? Definitely and luckily, yes. <laughs> um, flew the day after Easter in 2018, um, having which is always you know a like, bit good bit about mountains. You get great fun sort of eating, trying to put the extra layer on so you can lose the fat before muscle up up at altitude. So it was a very very greedy Easter, and then flew off just after that. Yeah, and I was over there for just under two months in 2018, which was very lucky. Third time lucky. Good. And how was that? How was the climb? Um, it was it was amazing. It's everything I'd read about, thought about. Some days were worse. Um, you know, you, it just your body definitely shouldn't be up there. Is you know, however fit, however strong you are, physically and mentally, your body really doesn't like being above eight thousand meters. And I take my hat. I was on oxygen, and I take my hat off to anybody who does it without oxygen. But I think if you do it without oxygen, you are a full time athlete. You have to, you know, it's such a different extreme of training. Um, but even with oxygen, my I could definitely, it wasn't shutting down. I was very lucky I didn't have any injuries, but you can definitely tell your body shouldn't be up there. And, you know, um, you sort of, when you're on oxygen, I, my body's, from, from when I first on the oxygen above, you know, when we left camp four and the high camp was 8,000 meters heading up to our summit bed, I hadn't had any problems the whole way up. No headaches, no sort of problem with breathing. I'd managed to sort of inhale with all sort of, you know, sweet or Pringles or, I don't know, some really nutritious worst nightmare what we eat on the mountain, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or cup of soup or something really extravagant like that. And it sort of started dry retching just below the balcony. And sort of, that's not, that would never been me on oxygen. I didn't know what was happening. Luckily, I was with this amazing guy called Basang, whose brother-in-law was with my teammates about half an hour ahead of me. You know, we all, they all, we all knew each other. We'd all climbed, as I said before, so it, that was good and my pulse was okay, my eyesight was all good. So all my stats were showing normal for that that altitude, that height. And um, so I then started worrying that it might be a sign my body was shutting down in a different way. And and I had tried promising that I don't to everyone I was saying goodbye to that I would, you know, deep push myself to the extreme, but I would definitely my aim was to come home. So then you sort of and your mind starts, you're you're shattered, you're, you know. 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, you're, you know, it's in a zone you shouldn't be in. Your mind starts playing tricks with you. And we luckily had everyone on the radio. I we radioed to base camp and they sort of eaten something, all the basics. And we had someone at camp two and they was, you know, checked everything. And then luckily my teammate came on the radio about half an hour ahead of me and started, which I won't repeat on here, started giving me abuse 
and winding me up and I bit back and you can hear everyone giggling on the radio so like saying she's absolutely fine so we knew it was just literally my body going through a, a bad patch and nothing worse so that was that was quite a sort of scary moment which you can't do anything to prepare for and we got to the balcony and all I will say is I will thank goodness you climbed in the dark because between the balcony and the south summit is obscenely narrow you've got drops by the side and you know photos don't do it justice it's just incredible and my one regret is I got a photo of the sunrise, which you can slightly see the curve of the earth. And I wish I'd taken a video of it because it just would have been amazing. But you you are fixated on that little dot of orange to your right for quite a few hours, knowing it's going to bring sunshine and warmth that doesn't seem to move in as fast as you'd like it to be. But it it was everything I wanted it to be and more, but I was very lucky. Did you have any issues with crowds? No, we were very lucky. Um, I was there in 2018. The photos in the press in 2019 was horrific. Those that you know, that famous photo again. We, I think we were very lucky. Combination of there were less people climbing that year for whatever reason. Also, we had a very long weather window. There was 10, 12 days of weather, so all the big teams had the chance to spread out. They weren't so rushing, you know, without worrying about you know the, the last. And I think that what went wrong in 2019 was all the sort of. They had like five, six days, which every single team, which there's a lot over there. And they're Western, Nepalese, as a matter of, you know, that's all trying to pile up there at the same time. And I think that's what caused it. We had no crowds. We did change our summit attempt by night. We, only because there was, was the year when Ant Middleton was there, then they were up there. We might have read about Ant Middleton being caught in the storm. So the storm he was caught in was the Sunday night, Monday morning. So no one went to the summit on the Monday night. So you, on the Tuesday night going to the summit, when we were meant to be going up there, you had sort of the two nights in one, which which when Ben Fogel was up there, and you've seen photos, and it was a beautiful morning, but there were about 130-odd people up there. We made the decision, which at the time, I felt like it was such a life-defining decision, the three of us made it, you know, because you, you, know, you think you've got the weather right, you think you've got the supplies, but actually, you know, would we regret it 24 hours later? We lay in our tent, hearing everyone leave, my teammate actually left and came back 45 minutes later, which I'm so glad he did for the gig and the following night. And the following night, we were incredibly lucky. Everything was on our side. Got my body having a half an hour wobble. Um, and there were six of us. When I reached the summit, there were six of us up there, including myself and Pasang, another person I knew. And then I was up there 45 minutes, and you can't fathom how far you can see. That's what's so extraordinary up there. But, and then for the last 10 minutes, I was, it was just myself and Pasang on top of the world. You could see people going down both sides, coming up both sides. But for 10 minutes, it was just he and I up there, which is just unbelievable. God, wow. That, that sounds incredible. It was. It was amazing. There were definitely some tears up there. Um, and also, I had my, my one girly moment of the whole two months trip when my hair had escaped my woolly hat and the frozen I touched and it crumbled in my hand. I was like, no! <laughs> but, um, but apart from that, it was an amazing 45 minutes up there. Wow. And so, God, I mean, it's, yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, if, you, you must have felt so lucky seeing those pictures in 2019 and just being like, thank, thank God, you know, I didn't have to witness that. Do you know what? I, I felt sick looking at it because I know I know how hot it is up there. I know how cold it is. I know how tar- you, how tired you are. Your body's sort of you're running on adrenaline at that stage, you know, between the South Summit and the Summit, Hillary Step. You you hear all the horror stories. We've all read the books and seen the films of you know the disasters in the 90, you know ninety six and things like that. And then starting to see it in twenty nineteen when I've been so lucky the year before. And actually, I think one of your previous guests was Geordie Stewart, and I messaged Geordie about it, and he was like, how lucky we both were the years we were there. We didn't have the crowds. You know, I was incredibly lucky. But actually, I saw things up there I don't particularly want to see ever again, but that was on a good year. So I doesn't bear thinking about what, you know, what people experience up there. And they must have been freezing. The auction would have been running out. It just, it just, and you also can't get around people. If someone is too slow, there's a crowd, you know, even if you decide to turn around, on that ridge, it was not even a ridge, it was just below the ridge, it just, you probably can't go either way. You'd be stuck. And that's, yeah, it, it made me feel physically sick looking at that photo. God. And so you've now done six of the summits. Was that Everest climb, that was the sixth one? Yes, I kept at the sixth. 
there was people would make, I thought thought about maybe keeping the seventh as the last one, but I didn't want to make a decision up high that I probably shouldn't make in case if it was the last one. You know, you just I wanted to hope I was making the right decision for the right reasons. Um, so the final one is going to be Mount Vincent yep. in Antarctica. Um, you know, we can we can all but plan and hope 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 for next year, but it depends on COVID and the world travels and and how it all pans out because it's closed down there at the moment. And obviously, they're very lucky they've got no cases. So I think let's let's try and keep it that way. Um, so that will be the final climb in the Seven Summits. Hopefully, fingers crossed. So I mean, it's it's quite remarkable that from going on your first desert adventure in the Sahara doing the Marathon de Saab to suddenly what 10 years later yeah yeah it was 10 years climbing ten Everest years of, ex- of, ex- of extremes but I yeah 10 years well yeah I did it was 10 years but I think yeah it was it was it was never planned it was never planned as I said um I think I was very lucky the opportunities came around and I and I'm very you know I can't wait to stand on the top of Vincent weather and body <laughs> if, everything, if everything goes according to plan and how in terms of sort of funding because I know when I spoke with Geordie we sort of brought up funding for funding for let's say Antarctica and climbing Mount Vincent how how do you go about it um yeah it's great climate for sponsorship isn't it <laughs> <laughs> I um, there was a couple of um sponsors who came on board for Denali um, in Alaska in 2017, who um, a couple came on for, for one-offs because they had a tie into Alaska and for America, or they were launching a company. It just worked. But there's a couple who've stayed, came on for Everest, who are kindly staying for Vincent as well, which is great. Um, obviously, then I, you know, that's not the whole thing. And so we start talking to people, and, and I was thinking about starting to approach people this summer, and then obviously COVID hit at Easter, so it's it's not really the email you want to send, like, hi, hope your health's good. <laughs> Would you like to write a blank check? Um, so we'll start again in the spring, you know, slowly, slowly. And, it, and I think the years of having one big sponsorship, you know, the expeditions of the 90s and the early 2000s, I think they all had a, you know, one big company who did the sponsorship, which I think those days are long gone. It's, it's lots of small sponsors and, and whether it's the talks and the social media, there's, di- there's different angles you can do that. So I think that'll... It'll be uh, it'll keep me entertained next uh, <laughs> next spring and summer, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of think, um, God, if you think about sort of how accessible these sort of big adventures have become over the last 20 years, you know, if someone had said 20 years ago, I'm going to climb Everest, it was like, whoa, you know. I mean, you're the only one in the world probably that even heard of or was trying to attempt it, whereas now, you know, it's I think it's great lots of people have, doing everything and jumping off the sofa and actually you know pushing themselves but I also it from the sponsorship sort of your your niche angle it's it's you know dilutes everyone it's you know it doesn't it you know there's a l- and also lot the of time, noise the time we're living in. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's a lot of noise there's a lot of noise um and masses but also I think you know the time we're in it's extraordinary and and I think that you know everything combined will be quite tricky and I think people are still keen to be involved but it's in a different angle and a probably a sort of small, you know, you have five small ones instead of two big ones, I would have thought going forward. It's a sort of mindset that you have when you go into these adventures because as I've sort of spoken on the podcast quite a bit, it's the sort of mentality to endure a lot where others might quit. Where, What's in the sort of back of your mind pushing you forward? I think I probably have a slightly in a stubborn streak, which I've discovered. <laughs> I think... Um, I think initially when I first started was raising money. Um, raising money was, was basically my 100%, one hundred percent one my goal, my main reason. Um, that's still there. I still, you know, not for like small things, but you know, for Everest I did for McMillan again and I'll do, you know, Vince in the final one for McMillan. So that's a small driving force. But also I it's if you're in a situation and you're lucky enough to get the sponsorship and be able to have a great team around it, I think I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky to be able to, to do that. Am I lucky that my body's able to endure what I'm pushing it through? If that makes sense. It just sort of, I, I think my stubbornness, my, I just, I just love the adventure. I love the not knowing what's next. You know, you wake up outside in a tent, whether you're in a desert or 
you know, you might have a sandstorm, you might have a snowstorm, you might have, you know, just, it's just, it's the not knowing where so much in life is contained and organized. Yeah. And do, I mean, in terms of your day to day life, how, how does it sort of compare sort of <laughs> <laughs> completely different? I, exactly. Damn suited, big club of boots, so sort of, you know, little black dress and heels. But I think I better, but I think it makes me, Better, I'm better at sort of everyday life because of the extremes I've seen and witnessed and done. Um, I'm probably less sort of, not tolerant, that's the wrong word, maybe take me to edit that out. But I think I'm, the small things don't bother me as much as they used to. If you're stuck in a traffic jam, it's still driving you completely cotty. But there are, you know, I think my day to day life, you know, if you're in a meeting or everyday life, something goes wrong, like actually, it's not, it's not something, you don't panic, you know, it doesn't upset you. Whereas, on a mountain, you know, because you see things in a mountain or on an adventure that are far worse. You know, on Everest, I was lucky we had an amazing summit morning descending and someone died at camp three an hour ahead of me. And that was horrific to see. And that was, you know, selfish point of view, a quite good slap in the face of me to realize I still had three and a half miles to descend to the relative safety of base camp. But also, you know, someone split second position has gone horribly wrong, but it's something I shouldn't have seen. And you don't want to see. And so, you know, if something goes wrong in everyday life, it's everything's relative. Do you feel that these adventures are almost like a drug now, whereby you are pushing yourself a bit further each time? Yeah, I think I think it's slightly. I think it is. It's slightly addictive. I mean, it's not sort of. I mean, every, every, all addictions are relative, aren't they? But I, I say this is well, maybe it's not a safer addiction. I don't know. <laughs> Definitely not. But I, I think it is. I think it's sort of, you know, you, you, it's like, you know, you go, you, there's three countries on your list you want to visit. You've ticked off two. Well, there's another four countries and they go back on your travel list, aren't they? And I think, yeah, I, you know, will I stop after my seventh mountain? Probably not. You know, I think I think it is addictive. However big or small the adventure is, you know, you can still get the go, a mini adventure or you know, a micro adventure, aren't they called in the Brecon Beacons or Scotland or Cornwall? But also you could do a trip to know, Afghan or Afghanistan or somewhere. Like just everything's relative, but I think it is it is slightly addictive actually, in a good way. <laughs> in a very good way. <laughs> um... So you, do you think it's addictive? Oh yeah, massively. I mean, this this is sort of how I got into it. it was very much, I sort of had the idea, and I think what I'm finding out by speaking to people on the podcast is it sort of starts with a, a 10k, and then a half marathon, and then a ultra marathon, and then from there you sort of you just say, oh, I did that. Now how far? And you just keep sort of nibbling away, pushing yourself, and it's sort of it also, when you live life slightly on the edge, the sort of monotony of day-to-day -day life becomes quite, well, not boring, but... It does, though, but you come back. It takes quite a while. You'll probably find that you, you, know, you come back from a big trip. It takes, quite, it takes me quite a while to get back into the normal way of life and sort of, as you say, the monotony of life, isn't it? It's yeah. Sort of... One of my favorite clips on a movie was... Have you seen the film Hurt Locker? No, I have to watch it. Uh, it's quite an old film, but it was about this guy who defuses bombs. And he, he's sort of out in Afghanistan or Iraq defusing bombs. And then he goes, well, after his sixth month tour, he comes back. And then there's just a clip of him in a supermarket looking at 26 different brands of cereal. <laughs> exactly it's just complete extreme whereas you're lucky to find a sort of you know a non you know a tube of pringles which are in date you know type thing yeah exactly and it's, but when you're on these sort of trips you know as i've spoken before on the podcast it's very much those small luck small things which in now you know me living in london is very much sounds disgusting but at the time you know, the idea of sleeping in a public loo, let's say, which has running water and electricity was a complete luxury to me. But now I, I wouldn't dream of doing it. But I'm sure <laughs> once, I, once I go back into adventure sort of mode, I'll be like, oh my God, this is amazing. Completely. If I don't have running hot water, I'm like, no, panic. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're at home in your day-to-day -day normal life, whereas actually, you know, on a mountain, you're, you know, you're lucky, you know, you've got to boil the water. It's just, it's just, it, it just puts, every, I think it puts everything into perspective. I think it's quite a good leveler. And I think, you know, 
I think I think more people should be able to do it, whether a small one or a, a big event. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be an Everest, but I think it's quite a good way of putting everything, as you're saying, you know, everyday life into perspective. Yeah, I t- I've certainly um, what's the word become less interested in sort of small pointless things. Where I think you know, ten years ago, when you're sort of a young adult or a late teen, those things are really, really important. But you sort of get to. I oh, know they were the be all and end all, and now you're like, oh. couldn't care less. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. I know. I will. I'm gonna write. Was it Hurt Locker? I'll write that down. Uh, it. Well, it's, it's just that cl- it's a very good film. I think it won an Oscar. But yeah, it was just that clip I remember so well. Of, him just going from one extreme to like another and you're just like whoa yeah it's, i remember actually from the summit of um, everest back to london was six days and i remember thinking and your i need to stop sort of actually properly slept when i got back to london because i think your body's sort of and it takes a couple of days your body still thinks it's sort of inhaling everything you're eating and drinking expects is dreading what you're going to ask it to do next <laughs> and then obviously you've gone from two months of choosing when i had dialed up to use a sat phone or you know you communicate with someone whether it's a blog or a you know, social media post to suddenly having you know 2020 or 2018 at the time technology was pinging in every direction it was quite a sort of so you fries your head sometimes you know you can't it's sort of it's out of your control but it is it's just yeah it's very weird yeah no i know and so um there's a part of the show which we ask the same five questions to each guest each week and and so the first one is on your trips and expeditions, whether climbing Mount Everest or running across a desert, what's the one bizarre thing that you crave or miss from home? I was thinking about this and my initial reaction, um, my initial, initial answer is probably sounds awful. <laughs> it's Diet Coke. <laughs> I have, I don't smoke, I don't drink coffee. Um, and I think, I think, you know, just, with, because on an expedition, it's you know it's electrolytes and water is there, and it's normally it's boiled snow. So, and obviously the odd bit of sort of you know electrolytes juice drink. Um, so I think I probably crave a really cold, not not daily one, but every so often. You know, when you get back after rotation or sitting back at base camp or in your tent, a really cold, cold diet coke. Nutritious worst nightmare, but yeah, that's good. <laughs> very nice. Um, what about your favourite adventure book? Oh, there's so many. I've got a bookshelf, which is just one of those sort of, probably doesn't help the addiction, does it, of all those ones. I think the first one I read was um, Robin Knox Johnson's book, when he sailed around the 60s, what, The World of My Own, I think it was called. He was the first person to do a solo around the world sail in the late 60s, which, you know, now we're in 2020, it's mind-boggling what he achieved at, in that era. Um, and I, you know, I'm not a water baby at all. I'm useless on boats. I don't like cold water swimming. So people who swim around the UK are phenomenal. So I think that, you know, in his era was even more amazing than when, when he wrote the book. What is your favorite adventure book? Um, I think that's, oh, I was thinking about this. There are too many. I love it. And I have a bookshelf full of farting books of need inspiration. It's quite a lot of people to draw on. But I think one of the first sort of pioneers of just extreme, and amazing ideas with Robin Knox Johnson when he sailed, I think it was, what's it called, sort of a world of my own. Um, and it was, what was the late 60s, and he was the first person to solo um, sail around the world, which I think in that era was even more, more mind-boggling than it is now. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. And way ahead of his time. I could think of nothing worse, but I think it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have an inspirational figure growing up? I think... Um, obviously, probably everyone always says this, but um, I think Randall Fiennes was, again, like Robin Knox Johnson, just so incredibly sort of forward thinking in those adventures. And I've luckily have all my you know, my fingers, so I haven't had to cut it in my own off. But I think what he's achieved over his lifetime is, is just mind boggling. Um, and I've heard him a couple of times speak, and actually, luckily, I was very lucky to overlap with him in Alaska. And, um, and the Americans in Alaska were quite sort of, um, they were very sort of, not nondescript, but they were very sort of blase about, they were like, oh, there's not a fellow Brit here. I was like, oh, how exciting, who? There's not many of us. You know, it's a small world, isn't it? And he's like, you know, ran off, ran, ran off. I was like, moon off. I was like, ran off. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's him. I was like, okay, where exactly is he on this mountain? Because <laughs> he was, he'd flown in like a couple of days with Hedeby on Alaska. 
So I was very excited about it. And he was doing a very below the radar trip. And he had four British doctors. So I was equally, you know, selfishly quite excited about some British doctors being a day ahead of me on a mountain as well. Um, sadly, he had to fly off um, two days later with a bad back. Um, so I actually overlapped with him in Talkeetna for a day of chats. And we had lunch, which was unbelievable. And he needs even better to talk to in real life than when you hear him in a talk or, you know, read his books. God. So I was very lucky. <laughs> wow, you are lucky. Um, did you ha- do you have a favourite quote or motivational quote? Ooh, there are some which which drive me absolutely potty. You see, come up there, and you're like, no, um, no pain. Or again, I think my favourite one. I don't know who wrote it. Um, Adventure may harm you, but not any will kill you. Which I think goes back to what we were saying earlier. That you know, however big or small the adventure is, just get out of your sort of normal day to day wherever you're based in the world, get out of your day-to-day regime because it's, just, it's so much better for you. Even if it's a half an hour a day, a night, it doesn't have to be two months in a tent. It just, I think, I, I need to find out who wrote this section. Um, <laughs> but no, that is my favourite one. Oh, amazing. That's a good one. I, I have heard it. And people listening are always keen to go on these adventures. What's the one thing that you would recommend them to get started? Talk to as many people as you can. Um, you know, talk, research, everyone, so, we're so lucky the adventures are coming, you know, years ago, it was just sort of, it was sort of you know, the top, the odd person here and there, was now so many people are doing it, whether it's a micro adventure or a big adventure, so there's always someone you can contact, whether it's social media, email, website, you know, friend of a friend, book, you know, there's, there's so much knowledge out there, and I think the more you can talk about it, the more you can brainstorm, you can have an idea, and, and they'll give you advice, which advice from someone else is far, far better than reading a book or looking it up online I think and um and everyone who's been there would love loves talking about it you know uh, I've spoken to people about climbing Killy and things like that or Mont Blanc or something or you know I probably told people not to run across deserts but <laughs> the climbing side of things and like don't do anything like your toenails but you know it's just I think talk to as many people as you can it doesn't matter how big or small your idea is 100% go for it back yourself you know mentally and physically and then I think just, you, you'd, you'd regret it if you didn't do it yeah and what are you doing now and how can people follow your journey? Um, what I'm doing now is trying to get <laughs> back to full fitness after too many lockdowns. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, the tire, the tire needs to come back out and start dragging it across the field. Um, I am going to start uh, preparing and planning my final climb, which will be um, Vincent and Antarctica. And the best way is via my website, which is lucyrb.com um, or Twitter, which is Lucy R. Bulkley. You see our folks, so. Oh, amazing. And so Mount Vincent is the next one. And what, you're hoping to do that in 2021? Yeah, I would love to. The season down there is sort of end of November to beginning of January. So I think that's family Christmas this year and skip next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, that will be planned depending on, you know, fitness team, all, all the usuals. Um, but that, that would be the... That would be the ideal, yes. Amazing. Well, hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we can follow your journey uh, when that happens. Fingers crossed, and thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to your stories. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>